Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Uh, this time round, as ever, we have something left field um, and uh, these have uh, really, really taken off uh, in value and following. I mean, they've always had a strong following, fast forwards, but um, it's this car, the Ford Escort Mark III Series 1 RS Turbo. And this series of Escorts, the, the Mark III, was made in a very different version in the US, but under the skin very similar. Um, and uh, they sold in their droves. It was the, the Ford Escort in the UK was the top selling car for years and years and years. And the Mark III version, this was the first one to have the front wheel drive across the car engine, the transverse engine and gearbox. Um, and it's amazing how coveted and how valuable these cars have suddenly become. Um, over the last few years, uh, fast forwards, um, uh, recently there was a Sierra Cosworth RS500, it must have been, uh, sold for over £600,000. Uh, I mean, crazy! Uh, um, now this car is not worth anything like that, of course, but nevertheless, it is a Concorde winning example of the, the Mark I, Mark III Escort RS Turbo. And this car actually has won 13 Concorde first prizes at RS um, Owners Club Concours, and it's actually had two second prizes. So um, it's, it's won 15 top level awards at Ford events, so it's pretty special. And uh, it was, um, even in its, in its day, it was sort of, oh, you know, Escort RS Turbo. And I used to work on these in their droves in the 80s and 90s and a little bit in the noughties. Um, I mean, I don't know how many are left, but uh, I think they made, they started out to make um, 5,000 of these. Uh, for the UK, and I think they ended up making 8,600. 5,000 was for homologation purposes. Um, they had to make so many to be eligible for Group A rallying. That's why uh, this was brought about. Um, rallying regulations insist that you make a certain number of a model before you um, go rallying with it. Uh, and that was uh, wh where the 5,000 came from. But um, it's, it's a, a very interesting car in hindsight. This car is immaculate. Um, it's, uh, it's been kept in a private collection and uh, it hasn't been shown recently or prepared to be shown. So if, it's, if you see a speck of dust on it, please don't be too critical. Um, the reason it's come in is for a misfire, uh, as the owner puts it, and I'll sort of investigate that. We've just shunted it into the workshop and we'll have a look what the actual problem is. Uh, I'll have a look around the car. There are some wonderful, wonderful things about this car, um, not just Tiggers. Um, this car is, um, it, it's got the original 1985 alloy wheels on it, which have been beautifully refurbished. The interior, the driver's seat, uh, that those oh so delicate foam bolsters in the bucket seats. I think they were made by Recaro for Ford, but I might be very wrong, actually. Um, they, uh, they were very delicate and sort of squashed and misshaped easily under the cloth. They are all, um, in this car, uh, the person who did in restored the interior went to the trouble of getting some original foam bolsters from South Africa and having them specially imported to restore the car. That's why the seats are just fantastic. Um, the interior uh, it is um, the super luxury version of the Ford Escort with chrome vent surrounds. Can you believe it? That chrome paint gets everywhere. Um, and other niceties like that, the beautiful digital clock in the roof, just it just um, reeks of 1980s edgy design, very square and very boxy. Uh, and with the, the engine, the CVH engine, um, as Ford called it, the compound valve angle hemispherical engine. Um, it's a very uh, long-winded way of what they did. It's a single overhead cam engine with the camshaft in the cylinder head and it operates rockers either side of it to open the valves at different angles. Um, and Ford had to use, because the valve train, um, the bits that move to open and close the valves were quite heavy. Ford had to use very heavy valve springs on this car. Um, actually more heavy than a Lamborghini Miura V12's valve springs. Um, and this engine revs to 6,700, I think, whereas the Miura's nearly eight. Um, so uh, there was a bit of 
bit of engineering involved, but um, the CVH wasn't the most successful engine in the world. Um, Jeremy Clarkson commented on how, how rough it was at the time, how unrefined it was. Um, and the reason for that was partly the heavy valve gear I was talking about, but th they did have some problems in service. I remember they used to break camshafts, literally break the camshaft in the cylinder head, because as the engine overheated, um, and needed to be skimmed afterwards because it had warped, the whole cylinder head went slightly banana shaped and you ended up with a cam trying to revolve in bearings that were not perfectly lined up. So the CVH had quite a few issues in service, but the ones that have survived like this are a very, very interesting piece of history. Um, and these cars are suddenly worth a lot of money and unusually, I don't say this about many videos, but unusually this car is for sale. So if you are interested in having one of the best RS turbos in the land, then um, get in touch with us and we'll, uh, we'll try and um, put you in touch with the owner. We will put you in touch with the owner. Um, so I'm going to find out what this, this misfire is and um, We'll sort it out. I hope it's nothing too serious. Um, they also were known for valve seats coming loose in the cylinder head, so I hope it's nothing like that. And um, we'll just delve a little more deeply. Well, first thing to do, I mean, this is obviously a light years away from how cars are put together now. Um, most of them don't even have this thing in them, uh, which is, of course, an internal combustion petrol engine. Uh, but first glance, I mean, it's so simple, this, by today's standards. Um, but nevertheless, I, I suspect a lot of modern mechanics wouldn't know where to start in finding a problem. Um, I'm not quite sure what form the misfire is taking, but everything is well exposed. We've got the, the fuel injection system down here, um, individual uh, spark plug leads for each cylinder. So first thing to do, I've carried out a visual check of everything. All these are nice and tight. Uh, everything is ship shape, but obviously there's something not right. So let's start it up and see what we have. Well, there is quite obviously something amiss here, literally. Uh, it's running, I can tell by the beat of the engine, it's down on one cylinder. It's running on three instead of four. So fortunately, there are various uh, tricks at my disposal to work out this. As I say, this could be an internal thing in the engine, or it could just be something very, very simple. So I'm going to get my... Uh, my first tool of the day, and let's, let's just try that. These are called um, chicken pliers, uh, and most mechanics these days will not have seen these. Uh, because you've got um, large amounts of kilovolts, thousands of volts going through the HT leads, it's very easy to get an electric shock if you happen to be the conduit between the HT lead and Earth, if you take it off. Um, in fact, I remember on one occasion, many years ago, I was tuning a Pontiac Firebird, an American car, with a very high energy ignition system on it, and the voltage actually cut my thumb wide open, right up. Um, so you have to be careful. Hence the fact these are rather cruelly in the trade called chicken pliers, because it implies that you're some sort of chicken if you use them, as opposed to using metal ones. I'll go for the chicken. Right, we'll just start to... Um unplug the leads and see if it makes ugh, a difference. Oh, hello. That's making no difference whatsoever. No difference. Okay, let's try this one. Hopefully, okay. That's made a difference. I'm pretty sure we found the problem already. It's running on three. Let me just double check that making no difference whatsoever. I'm going to start with the easy bits and take the spark plug out.
let's have a look at this. Okay, the spark plug is black everywhere, apart from this washer. Uh, I wonder if this is a Motorcraft spark plug, which was what, f that was Ford's brand name for their parts. Um, this is not too hot because it hasn't been working. It's warm. Yeah, Motorcraft. There we are. Um, I suspected as much. Nothing against Motocraft spark plugs because, to my knowledge, they were no more or less reliable than any others. Um, but uh, this is v very contaminated at the end, so that is not working. Could it be as simple as just a spark plug gone down? That would really make my day. Um, let's try it. Well, at the risk of being heretical and not using Motocraft spark plugs, um, I'm actually using one of my favourite brands. This is a serious plug for um, NGK spark plugs, which I've used for years and always found them to be, uh, to be very good. So this is a, a BCR ATS, which is the correct grade and heat range and type. Uh, it's set preset to 1.0 millimeters. Um, and uh, we'll check that and then uh, we'll put a set in this, set of four. We'll keep the old Motocraft spark plugs because uh, I think the owner might actually try and find another set of Motocraft spark plugs, but that's, maybe he won't. That's not my decision. But we'll put these in anyway, and I hope it's as simple as that. Wouldn't that be marvellous? Okay, and then I can set up the fuel injection system and uh, we'll take the car for a run. This is very old school now. I don't think there's a car made with HT leads like this. I might be very wrong. Over the end of the plug. And then, oof, quite a lot of pressure to get that to click. No. There we go. Right, let's start it up and see how that sounds. Right, the moment of truth. Can it really be as simple as a spark plug down? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Let's try it. Yes. Fabulous. Well, after that almost embarrassingly um, easy diagnosis and rectification, if only everything in life was as simple as that, um, I'm now going to adjust the fuel injection system uh, mixture-wise, so it's uh, giving the best ideal mixture. Uh, it's, this is the Bosch Cagetronic system, which I won't go into massive detail here. Um, it's used on lots of cars, so it's, it's fairly easy to acquaint oneself with if necessary. Um, K for constant, uh, meaning it's constantly metering fuel out to each uh, cylinder. Um, and then they just suck it in as part of the inlet charge uh, before they compress and ignite it. Very clever system, very simple. But I always check the mixture because it's inevitably a bit weak. Um, and there is a screw that blanks off the adjusting screw hole. And uh, also, if it hasn't been undone for a number of years, as, as they haven't been generally, because people don't normally adjust the fuel injection, um, you know, the car runs pretty well without being optimal, then uh, the screw can be stuck. So I never know quite what I'm letting myself in for, but uh, I've got to get the screw out if we're going to do this. I just uh, don't want it to be so tight that un something unsavory happens, like we, we uh, start to damage the screw or something. But let's have a go and um, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's delve. Oh, yes. Oh, gets better by the minute. So I'll take the screw out. And that gives us access to the fuel injection mixture adjustment screw. Very carefully not dropping it. Well, I always have a special Acme tool um, from the workshop for uh, any particular job we're doing. Um, and this is a three millimeter extended reach Allen key or hex key. Uh, and I'm gonna put this in the hole in the screw we've just taken out. 
and that very gently rests you can see that's resisting me turning it there and that's because that is now on the mixture adjustment screw inside the fuel distributor or metering head um, and what happens generally is if the mixture is right on these cars because I've introduced a minor air leak as it's called into the induction system I know the mixture's right by I mean yes it's great to use a CO meter and that's the ultimate test but um, having done this for a, a, quite a long time I generally know whether it's right or not um, the, uh, the the running should be slightly rough because it's weak and then when I put my finger on the hole to seal it it should pick up uh, and run smoothly and that is when you know it's right so um, I'm going to start the engine up uh, we'll take this out for the moment um, because it shouldn't be in there while you're starting then so I'll just start it now and it probably will be lumpy <laughs> well as you can see it's it's not very happy um, so it is actually a bit weak as I thought so we'll just it's gonna be even weaker when I pull this screw out of here It is so I'm now going to adjust the mixture I'm going to turn it slightly rich which is clockwise and let's just try putting my finger in the hole it's still a bit weak Tiny bit more. That's rather nice now. Yeah, it's still a bit weak that. I'm just gonna turn that a wee bit more. Let's try it again. do not want to lose this screw. Thank you very much. Right. That's still a bit weak. So when I pull this out, the engine tone will change drastically. That's more like it. That's lovely. Yes. Okay, I'll lower the idle speed a bit because it's now running a bit fast. There we are. That is a happy engine. We'll take it for a run now. See how see how she goes. Well, here we are back in the 1980s. Um, yeah, I, I didn't uh, remember my mullet today, unfortunately, but everything else is. Um, is uh, very much alive and kicking on the automotive front. This thing, oh my goodness, this takes me back. Um, the ride is quite bumpy. Um, and the exhaust is quite boomy. I don't remember what the, exhaust, the RS Turbo exhausts were like, but um, 
this is uh, this is definitely interesting. Oh, God. incredible, incredible. Um, and we got no turbo boost gauge here. The instrumentation is super rudimentary. Um, just a temperature gauge and a fuel gauge. Whee! <laughs> Um, and uh, a rev counter and a speedo, that's it. But you know what, it feels, it feels so nice. It sits on the road perfectly. It doesn't tram line one way or the other. It's arrow straight and it all feels nice and tight. There's no play in any of the controls. Um, we do know the mileage uh, is genuine, 64,000, but the car has been restored. Gentleman trying to prove something. Um, and uh, yeah, it's um, it feels lovely, really does. This chunky padded 1980s steering wheel, ah, oh, wonderful. Um, but it feels as smooth as silk. That uh, that fuel injection system, it was a bit weak, um, and it feels lovely. There's no hunting, no holding back, uh, no ignition problems, no firing on less than four cylinders. Uh, just great. So we're just going to warm it up. Um, and see, see what 132 brake horsepower feels like. As I mentioned earlier, I used to look after a lot of these. We used to do a lot of work on, on them. And um, I do remember on one occasion, we were under the cosh. The owner needed it for an event or something. This was in the late 80s, actually. So they must have been very current, very new. And um, it was a white Mark I like this and uh, the owner wanted it back as soon as possible. So, and there was a crack in the exhaust which we had to have welded. And I had a, a customer with a uh, metal fabrication business and we had no way of getting the exhaust to him. So I actually uh, used the, the hangers, the correct exhaust hangers underneath the car and um, disconnected it at the manifold. So it was effectively an open exhaust on the manifold with the rest of the system hanging under the car and I drove it to his workshop which was about two miles away um, with no exhaust on and it was really interesting because the exhaust was hardly any louder with the turbo not working than it would have been if the exhaust was fitted it was very quiet at the front end uh, because the turbocharger actually did, did a lot of the silencing of the exhaust system the fact that you had this great big turbine in the middle of the exhaust system um, actually stopped it um, stopped it being noisy but the moment the turbo started to spool up whoa the noise was deafening so I managed to uh, to get it there and back we took it there took it off the car he welded it up we put it back on again and I got it there and back by driving it very gently with no turbo boost and um, it, it worked but uh, yeah there aren't too many cars you could drive with zero exhaust on them on the public road without people staring at you in utter disapproval and hatred um, but uh, talking of disapproval and hatred let's um, let's give it a bit of stick now and open the taps oh yes Oof. interesting rev limiter very subtle not but uh, wow, I mean the car's so light, so no wonder it's got plenty of oomph, but trying not to hit the rev limiter again. Gosh, it feels quick. It feels very quick. Um, I have no reason to believe this car is modified um, over and above the, uh, the 132 brake horsepower, but as I say, they're light. Um, I, it, it's an interesting question because I don't know how light this car is. Um, probably under the ton, I would think. Um, and it's all about power to weight ratio. It's, it's all right having 1100 brake horsepower in a Veyron or a, a Chiron or whatever, but it's the weight of the car. Um, they probably weigh over twice, maybe even three times what this car does. Um, that's probably a slight exaggeration, but um, Nevertheless, power to weight is where it is, and this is just great. Fantastic. Funnily enough, one thing that does occur to me 
while I'm driving this is the storks, the action of the storks on the steering column. Um, it's amazing how in years past car manufacturers have got stork, wonderful stork assemblies that feel lovely to work and they don't try and slip out of your fingers when you try and operate them. Um, and how many of them are the exact opposite these days? They just feel really unpleasant to use and they, they're the wrong shape to grip while you're doing it subconsciously. But these are lovely, this lovely little square stalk just falls easily to hand. And I think that for me, the stalk winners um, were the 3, 5 and 7 series that BMW made in the 80s. So the sort of E30, uh, E36, um, the 5 series would be the E34, and the 7 Series would be the U32, if my, if my recollections are right. Um, th they were just lovely stalks to use, beautifully precise. And it's amazing how wrong car manufacturers get it these days. Um, you know, it's something so simple, but something that we, we use many, many times when we're driving. But this car is lovely. And um, I think it's with a little bit of cleaning up. This is going to be ready for another concourse soon. It's just great. Um, it's very low tech. You've got the CVH engine um, and five speed box, which is great. Um, and the turbo is literally just bolted onto the exhaust manifold. It's not a high tech turbo at all. No variable vane technology. As far as I know, um, it's not water cooled. It's just uh, cooled by the oil circulating. So it's a very old school turbo. So if you do have the uh, the good fortune to own one of these or a similar Aero turbo car, chances are if you've given it a very spirited run, um, bear in mind you need to let the engine idle for um, maybe a minute or two to let the, the, uh, the, the heat of the turbo cool down. Uh, it's very important to, to keep the engine oil circulating because the turbo can run dry and actually in extremis the engine oil in the turbo can get so hot it crystallizes and stops any more getting through which of course is death for the turbo but um, so a little tip for turbo car owners of the uh, the 70s and 80s um, but uh, yeah this car is lovely one more time let's just open the taps feels as though it's going to leap out of the uh, the engine compartment at any second but that's what front wheel drive cars were like of this era um, just a very visceral and uh, and fun car this it really is well that concludes another Tyrrell's classic workshop video hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we'll be back with something else very soon